Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome you for this inter uh, Institute for International and European Affairs webinar, which is part of the Development of Matters lecture series supported by Irish Aid. We are delighted to be joined today by Hindu Ibrahim, um, who's been generous indeed to uh, share her thoughts with us for the next uh, few minutes. She'd speak to us about 20 minutes or so, and then we go to a a Q&A uh, with our audience. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function, which you should see the lower part of your screen there. Um, I'd encourage you to uh, f uh, feed in questions throughout the session as they occur to you. Um, and we'll come to those questions then once Hindu has uh, finished her presentation. Uh, a reminder that um, today the presentation and the Q&A are both uh, on the record. Um, you should also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IEIEA. Um, a, a further medium, we're live streaming uh, this afternoon's discussion. So to all of you tuning in via YouTube. Hindu Umaru Ibrahim is a Chavian environmentalist and geographer, an expert in indigenous people's adaptation to climate change. Um, as an indigenous woman from the Umbororo and pastoralist people in Chad, um, Ibrahim founded the Association of Indigenous Women and Pastoralist People in Chad. Uh, she's worked on a 2D and 3D participatory mapping initiative in Chad's Sahel region. Um, in 2019, she became one of 17 people to be appointed as an advocate of sustainable development goals by the United Nations Secretary General. Um, she's coordinator of, of the uh, Association of Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad, and um, she has served as co-director of the Pavilion of World Indigenous Peoples Initiative and at uh, COP21, COP22, COP23, and COP27. And she now co-chairs the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. Before we hear um, from Ms. Ibrahim, I'd like to hand the floor to Sinead Walsh, who is Climate Director at Irish Aid, to deliver some opening remarks. Over to you, Sinead, please. Thanks so much, uh, Owen, and uh, it, it's great to uh, it's great to be here today for this uh, to introduce this wonderful uh, keynote speaker, uh, Hindu Ibrahim, who I, I've uh, certainly been following and uh, coming across in all those fora that you mentioned. Uh, as you said, Owen, I'm the climate director uh, at the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we support this series. Uh, we we think it's a, a really important um, you know set of conversations, and I think today uh, is a really good example of that, uh, not just a conversation about climate, which we all know is, is critical, uh, but precisely, uh, you know, inclusive and just uh, climate action and, and environmental protection and, and, and also uh, other themes as well that I know Hindu will, will, will come across. Um, we're at slightly, uh, um, you know, uh, I suppose at the end of, of a week where we had the hottest day ever uh, last Monday, um, and, and I think, you know, everybody Watching this will, will, I think, be quite worried about the kind of statistics that are coming out on, on climate uh, change at the moment. Um, but I suppose what, what uh, I would stress, and I think what relates to our work, uh, uh, our, our discussion today, um, is that the climate change uh, conversation uh, is not and should not be uh, just about science and whether we have to focus on uh, the people that are affected by all of this and indeed the people uh, who can who can work uh, collectively uh, together to uh, to actually make make a change, um, and I suppose for, from Ireland's point of view, when we work on on climate diplomacy uh, internationally, we really are very focused on on how can we help uh, the kind of uh, communities that Hindu will will talk to us uh, about today, uh, communities that are often uh, very vulnerable to climate change, uh, despite not having uh, caused it um, and, and who have a lot of wisdom to provide. So, for example, at, at COP27, Ireland was very involved in, in the loss and damage uh, discussion, and I'm currently 
uh, sitting on that transitional committee that was established to operationalize the fund and, and funding arrangements for loss and damage. And our key priority as Ireland is precisely this point about uh, where this funding, who this funding will target and, and trying to make sure it is those, those most, uh, most vulnerable um, communities. But I think we, we need to be careful as well uh, that, that you know, we focus on you know, the, the, the enormous benefit that we can get, uh, particularly from Indigenous uh, communities and, and all that they can, um, you know, teach us about how we should be working, uh, taking care of nature and, and, and by extension, um, taking care of each other. Um, so, you know, just to, 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 to finish on, on our side, our climate diplomacy, but also our climate finance is, is very much focused on, on reaching those uh, communities. Uh, we are happily in the process of, of, of doubling our, our climate finance uh, by, by 2025. Um, and again, with that focus of locally led adaptation of gender responsive activities and, and reaching those communities in, in particularly in, in, in least developed countries and, and small island uh, develop, developing states. But actually one, one exception to that that I just wanted to mention uh, was a lot of work that we're doing uh, in the Amazon with indigenous communities. We've got about a million euros invested in in local organizations there that are on the one hand uh, and i'm sure you know them very well uh, uh hindu and instituto socio ambiental and fundo casa um, and these are our organizations that are both fighting against uh deforestation environmental degradation uh, but also uh you know trying to expand their role in in governing and, and sustainably managing their their, their territories. So um, we're, it's, it's work that we're very proud of, but we're very uh, much, I suppose, uh, kind of uh, conscious of how much we, we need to learn uh, from experts. And, and Hindu Ibrahim is definitely such expert and I think is, is very well known within, within the climate sector, certainly uh, for her insights, for her expertise, uh, and, and just really looking forward uh, Hindu to, to hearing from you and, and, and thanks for thanks for giving us the time uh, today and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sinead, and thank you, Owen. Thank you, all the institutes, for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure being with all of you there. And I'm uh, so happy to hear that you are sitting at the Committee of the Loss and Damage Transitions, and that will give me more uh, chance also to share it with uh, other indigenous communities around the world because it is important. So for the discussion today, I wanted to share a little bit about me and what we are doing and what from indigenous peoples can inspire the uh, uh, world's communities. So as uh, in the presentations that said already by uh, Owen, I am coming from a nomadic communities pastoralists. They are called it Mbororo. We are a cattle helders with the cow that uh, produce milk and meat, who is the best of our economy. But those cows are also one way of co-opting all the resilience and adaptation and land restoration around the fragile ecosystem of the Sahel. So for, for us being pastoralists, it's following the rainfall. So the rain is the most important in our life and where there is rain, so there will be a pasture. So we are moving, following the rhythm of the season in order to protect the ecosystem and also to protect ourselves. So our unique culture and relationship based on the environment that we are aspiring from the way of living of our peoples. So in the, all the Sahel regions, with climate change impact, it is the most vulnerable one. And you all maybe read it or maybe listen it from the expert group of the uh, uh, climate change, the IPCC. We are the most vulnerable, the most impacted. But yet my communities who is still living, depending from the environment, from the rain, feel the most the impact of this climate change because we are, do not have like the supermarket where we go, can go and buy our food but we have it only when the rain come and we cannot protest in the street because we cannot protest over the rain or over lack of the rain so we can only be rely from what nature is giving us and that put us in a very critical situations with the climate change impact we, and of course with the loss of the biodiversity when the climate change impact is coming so the uh, most impact coming from the temperatures as uh, we hear from CN said, like uh, the world recorded the most uh, high temperature on the last Monday, 
So for me, it's like, okay, how the calculation come? Because I'm around Paris those days, and then the higher temperature is like 30 degrees. So in chat, when during the summer with the climate change, we can go over 50, 50 degrees Celsius. And 50, it's a lot because that what make the water evaporated, that what create all the incense around the ecosystem because they get all dry. And even you can feel the heat in your body and that impact the rain immediately. And in the rain, it's changed the seasons. So last year we get like a very heavy rain season that ended up with the flood around Chad, Niger, Nigeria, many, people died in those floods because we do not get prepared from the flood just to coming up two months after the rainy seasons. And at the same time, we have thousands of people who become homeless because they lost their home uh, overnight when the floods come around all the places and it is case also in my own family where my brother was he sleeping he wake up uh, in the morning and his feet was underwater by the end of the day the water was like one meters above so just so you have to save yourself but you cannot think about the rest of the stuff so that end up also with uh, a social impact of the climate change so the social impact it's uh on two way firstly is in our economy on the rural area where people lose all their economy, they lose their cutters, they lose their uh, agriculture, and they have to migrate. Either they migrate to the big cities or they migrate to another cities of Africa. I'm not talking about the international migration. That is very sad for the host country, but it is more sad for the countries inside where we have like internal migration within the regions because people are losing all their economy. They are losing all their life and livelihood. And the second one is the conflict. The conflict between the communities that are fighting to get access to the remaining resources when you look at last month there was a big conflict around south of chad where there was also a tens of tens of people that dead because there was a pastoralist and then farmers who was fighting because of the uh, natural resources accesses and it is the same just uh, two weeks ago around lake chad that community are fighting among themselves because of lack of the resources of this year then they kill like a lot of cattle and then the social dynamic is start changing. Even the peoples who used to live in harmony for long, now they turn it into the enemy and fighting each other. And in the top of this conflict, you have like a terrorist conflict where like you get Boko Haram around all the regions who is getting the opportunity of the poor people, poor regions, and then recruiting and getting more and more space around this like chat area, as well as around on all the Sahel regions when you talk about Mali, Burkina Faso, where every single day there is also attack. So the damage on the adaptations and mitigations for us, it's also uh, the damage on loss and damage because we are losing not only our way of living, but we are losing our culture, our identity, the place that we are living. And when we talk about the loss and damage at the international level, for us in my community and many peoples in the Sahel, we are leaving it for the truth. So all those impacts have another impact directly on the food security of the communities because when they uh, uh there is not enough rain or there is a lot of rains it's impact the pastures and the cattle that we are rely on it who produce the milk who used to produce more morning and afternoon they produce now during the dry season only one every two days and during the rainy seasons one every single day and that impact our food security and it's made people's more weak and then we have to cope with the new coming food in our peoples and it's ending up with a lot of sickness people getting diabetes that we do not used to have in my communities and even cancer and all those come just like this last decade. We never know that there are another sickness in the communities without seeing the real climate impact that impacting our food, changing our way of living in our system. 
and to link it with the international level, it is the same as you all know. Indigenous peoples around the world, we are representing 5% of the world's populations. And this is also our forces. We are protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity. We are protecting one quota of the land in the earth. So that means even we are living in Chad, this drama on the climate change impact, we do have our traditional knowledge that we are helping to protect those nature. At the same time, my brothers and sisters in Amazon or in Congo Basin or in Himalaya or even in the Arctic where there is glaciers, we are protecting our ecosystem that we live in depending on need. We protect our tropical forest by our traditional knowledge because we know which species of the nature can help to, to maintain the ecosystem of the tropical forest. We protect the coral reefs around all the Caribbeans and Pacifics because the indigenous peoples there, they know which places that can help them to get more fish and to protect them from the hurricane. And even a grandma can know after the hurricane where she can get a fresh water uh, to feed her families. And even in the Arctic, it is the same where we know that like the ranges can move from one place to another one during a, a a, a very heavy snow and then following by the heat and then the ranges have to dig to get the pastures down. It is the same in African in Savannah, as I said, in my communities. So our unique traditional knowledge and wisdom are so crucial to protect all the humanity from the climate change impact and biodiversity loss. But yet we are not in the center of the decision making. They are taking us as victim and all the response to what we are experiencing as our humanitarian response. And that cannot solve the problem. Humanitarian response is just like a very short response over a crisis. What we need is how indigenous peoples can take all the decisions together with the politicians to change the policies who can be adapted to all what we need, to take the decisions with the financial partners to be also as partners, not as beneficiaries. We refuse to be beneficiaries because we are bringing a lot from our knowledge, from our wisdom to the table. So we are not beneficiaries, we are partners, financial partners and ecological partners. So through all that, we should play our role full and effectively and let me share with you a couple of examples on how we are playing our role to help so we can help to protect the crucial ecosystem and give advice to the protections of the nature as a first response to the climate change because if you do not protect the nature you can end the fossil fuel today you can end everything stop it today but we will be going to more than 1.5 degree so nature play a big role in the climate fight and the best one who can protect the nature are the indigenous peoples as we are protecting the 80 percent of the world's biodiversity second we can use our wisdom our traditional knowledge concretely and as i used to say for us living with our nature it's help us to learn from this nature my parents, my grandparents, they just to know how to read from a burst, burst migration, cloud position, from the lift of the trees, from the flowers of the trees to predict the weather. And the way that they are predicting the weather help us to better build our resilience and move from one place to another one. And those traditional knowledge around all the world are very, very important for our life and the life uh, of the rest of the species around the nature. And then the third one is like uh, how we can use the science knowledge, traditional knowledge and technology to build a better tools for the community to better adapt to the climate change uh, impact. So I do a 2D or 3D participatory mapping. So the 2D participatory mapping, I use the satellite images. The 3D, I use the geographical informations from the baseline. And that helped me to go back to the communities, put all the science knowledge, for example, the 2D participatory mapping. I am working to digitalize a map of 3,500 kilometers square around Lake Chad. I went to the communities with this map. We put all the knowledge 
from the forests that are protecting us to give us food, the forests that are sacred, we do not touch, we do not cut, from the forests that are giving us the traditional medicine. We are mapping all the different species of the water, the wetland, the well, etc. We map all the uh, uh, islands, all the movement of the cattle, the movement of the peoples, and that help us to build a big data for the community to help them mitigate the conflict of resources, to help them manage the uh, natural resources that are shrinking and to have a dialogue in order to better have a plan for the resilience and adaptation that build it by them. So combining all those knowledge from indigenous peoples can help us to solve a lot of problems of climate change, for example, by putting all the carbon steam and that can help us to reduce the emission by having the most, most, most adapted uh, uh, strategies and knowledge on agriculture to have mitigate, uh, mitigation of the food security and poverty. And it can help us also to reach the sustainable development goals like access to the water, access to the land, etc. So those traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples cannot be happen without a partnership of everyone. We need the partnership with government, with institutes like who are doing all the research, designing the policies for the government, like yours one here. And I love the title, sharing ideas and chipping policies. So we need to partners to share the ideas, to reform and chip all the policies in order to implement a better decisions. And we also need to see the, the indigenous peoples as warriors. We are the warriors. We are the one who are protecting the earth. We are not the past, we are the features. So we do not ask the peoples to come back, live in my nomadic way, but we ask the peoples to cope from our wisdom, from our way of living, to live in harmony with the species. Most of the developed world, I am always get like very, I missed when I go to the supermarket, everything have an inspirational debt, even the water. So it is not a sustainable way of living if it's based on the consumptions. Every single day you have to get inspirational debt because you need to buy more, consume more, and the one you didn't consume, you have to throw it. So the resources are not coming from the sky, the resources are in the nature. So coped from what indigenous peoples are doing to cooperate with ecosystem, to live in harmony with the nature, to understand the importance of the ecosystem for our breathing clean air, for our eating, and for our drinking water. So because of being inspired by indigenous peoples, vision, it is a way for business also and the local authority to deliver a very good expectation from peoples to have a better life. Health of the peoples, good food, clean energy, clean water. So all those business must inspire also from indigenous peoples way of using the ecosystem, way of logging, way of, uh, of using all the natural resources. So uh, that's all what I wanted to share with you. By doing that, I think we all need to listen to each other, to put indigenous peoples in the center and putting us in the decision making tables and sharing all the financial resources to direct access finance for the indigenous peoples. To do not think that one model of, this, of the finance that designed by Western can be helpful for all the rest of the world. If it was helpful, we will not going to be here and discuss about climate change. So there is need of the reform of the finance, listening from the indigenous peoples, giving the direct access finance from what we want, how we are going to manage it, and building the trust among all of us to end all those crises on climate change with all the rest of the crises around the world. And I thank you so much for listening to me, and then I will be very happy to take any discussions with you for that. Thank you. Over to you, Owen. Hindu, thank you very much indeed for a powerful uh, presentation. I mean, uh, it seemed to me that you made a, a really unanswerable case. Uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the message about uh, the indigenous people think for perhaps around 5% of the global population, but um, having a far higher 
um, impact on, on protecting nature and biodiversity and climate change impacts. Um, I, I, I also thought it was it was really powerful the way you put that um, so many, perhaps in, in this part of the world, will, will think of, uh, of people as beneficiaries of humanitarian programs. And that's not that's not the identity that you, you want to, to recognize the role of indigenous people as partners in, in actions to protect uh, nature um, using, for instance, you talked about the traditional knowledge to, to build resilience, um, to, to uh, use scientific knowledge. And you gave your own example of the uh, mapping the surroundings of, of Lake, Lake Chad search and and shaping the the necessary programs um i i believe you you did refer to financing and i wonder if we could start off by exploring that area um uh, the summit for a new global financial pact took place was in in paris i i i think and um that was aiming to to build a new consensus for and a more inclusive international financial system to to fight inequalities and finance the climate transition and bring us closer to achieving the sustainable development goals um what's what sort of impacts um, how how successful was that meeting and what sort of impacts could this have for indigenous people right so uh, it was last week the new pact for uh, finance that is held uh, in paris and now uh, hosted by uh, co-hosted actually by president macron and then premier minister of barbuda's mia it have been interesting to see how like Barbuda's as developing world is small islands and hosted with France in the as developed world around all this finance. So one of the remarks that I saw, it was only one representative of the civil society attended one of the panels because they have the opening and closing and then they had six round tables. All the round tables have been presidentials with only the financial institutions. They forget that the people who are representing the the, uh, uh, the 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 rest of the populations who are representing by the civil society must have something to say around finance. When we talk about the finance, it is not only the head of state or the financial institution who should talk, but also the representative of the civil society must be spoke, spoken there because there is no resources of finance without the peoples and all the fi uh, financial resources cannot be decided by those who are also using it badly. So that was a big interrogation from myself to see, are the world enough understanding the crisis where we are on it now? When we talk about inflations, we are talking about a poor woman somewhere or a poor young person person somewhere who is going to the supermarket and seeing that the food prices are increasing or in my community someone who is going once every week to the market who are seeing that the prices is increasing it is not the president who is sitting in his office and waiting for the uh, cookers who will bring him food it is not the world bank uh, president or the imf chair who are sitting in their desk and having a bodyguard who are thinking about this inflation or getting impacted by the inflations so that's why like the firstly the role of the civil society lacking in that conference but that said during the conclusions of the meeting there was a honest discussion between developed and developing world there was a demand of the world need to open their eyes especially the g20 to do not just to meet g20 and decide of the future of the world where is the place of africa who have 54 countries who are meeting there so how the African can take part in the G20 negotiation or discussions to also make saying something and that will be taken into consideration that was requested by the African countries. And then the second was about the debt release. So they, there was a lot of debt around Africa, Asia and Latin America, but mostly in African countries. There is depth from developed world, but there is depth also from emerging countries to the developing countries. So 
they do not think about there is ecological depth who make them rich so all the countries from the south requested the cancellation of the debt over the natural resources and climate change that we are getting impacted too and then the thirdly was how the financial institution can get reform there is need of reform of all the financial institution that have been created after the first world war and that was only by developed world who decided how they can ship the world's economy and then created an institutions putting all their money and see how they can lend it money to the developed world but the world changed a lot there is emerging country there is developing country there is climate change so how the financial institutions can change and be built better with all the rest of the humanity. So that was interesting to see in that conference. And one thing that lacking from uh, what, I, and, uh, what I saw also, it is where is the direct access finance to the communities who are protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity? Are they in the tables? Are they getting the finance to continuously protect the environment? Are they getting recompensated because their home are burning? or their, their home are flooding, or they are losing their island, losing their life. Did they think about how they can recompensate which kind of finance that they put there? So that was many of the questions I ended up from that conference. And I hope that by the COP28, it will be some of the result. But anyway, we are watching them and we will be continuously requesting them to change the way of finance. Crucial issue. Um, uh, there's a question from Leanne Digny, who's a researcher at, at the, uh, uh, a UN researcher at the IIEA, uh, which changes focus a little bit towards the more the litigations uh, side. Uh, she she says that um, in recent years, Indigenous people have been instituting legal battles to challenge governments and the private sector regarding uh, climate change action or or the lack of climate change, indeed. Um, there's been some limited success in, in the legal cases, mostly decided on the grounds of constitutional fundamental human rights law. But uh, she highlights uh, in September uh, last year, the UN Human Rights Committee upheld a joint complaint filed by Indigenous people in Australia's Torres Strait and found that Australia's failure to adequately protect against climate uh, related impact violated the, uh, the Torres Strait Islanders' rights under the um, uh, ICCPR. How hopeful uh, would you be that this decision marks a change? Do you think the climate litigation will have more effective outcomes for Indigenous communities in the future, um, um, Hindu? I think the world is waking up and we got many now legal peoples from uh, lawyers who wanted to support indigenous peoples and who are creating actually a platform for indigenous peoples to to just to talk to them to advise them legally and to protect the indigenous peoples and to take the case so this is really like different than the past years we got the support from the non-indigenous but who are professional in their work that are supporting indigenous peoples it is the case of australia yes but it is also the case in tanzania in kenya or, or around the ogiaka land it is the case in latin america so all those indigenous peoples around the world are making a case to hold the government or companies accountable for their inactions on climate change or the lack of protection of the right of indigenous peoples maybe some of them we can win them like the ogia case in kenya we win that and then there is recognitions of the Ogiak land to be giving back. But there is a big challenge of the implementation of the decision because the decision also needs to be implemented by the government. And as government lost the case, they are not like moving fast to implement this decision to give back the Ogiak people their land. It is the same case in Tanzania also where uh, they move the indigenous communities there to make it like a protected area for tourism. 
So the indigenous peoples are still fighting because it is the land, it is the place where they are grazing, where they have their cattle. And the excuse of the government of Tanzania is like not they uh, the, the Maasai or uh, the indigenous peoples there was not there like uh, in hundred years ago. So it is not like an excuse completely. So there is still like lack of the action. And when we come back to the case of the uh, Australia, so Australia have more the advanced because there was many indigenous peoples who also went to school there, who have also the degree, who are also some of them may become a lawyers. So I have more hope in that case to become an examples for the worldwide indigenous peoples to see it can work. So it might take maybe some time, but I have more faith in this uh, act in Australia. And there is also the human rights uh, 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 organizations in Geneva who are supporting the Australian indigenous peoples. We have also a recommendation made by the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in last April in New York for that case. So that will be very helpful, I think, to use all the international case to make it at the national level and to follow with the government to respect it. Mm, very interesting. Th thank you very much for that. There's a question from uh, Philip Wende, who's Assistant Head of Academic Affairs at the Technological University in Dublin. Um, and it has some um, echoes with some issues in, in Ireland as well, I have to say. Um, he suggests that pastoralists as Indigenous communities will continue to face the uh, sharp end of the effect of uh, climate change as, of course, 100% of the life support systems, as you very clearly illustrated earlier in your remarks, is seasonal. Um, it's the, uh, the rains are crucial. Um, and he suggests that the precariousness is exacerbated by typically high cattle stocking rates, high population growth, inadequate uh, food security, um, uh, with, you know, uh, the preservation technique, te uh, available and decline in biodiversity. Um, some uh, he he wonders if some of the key impact mitigation drivers could be uh, among the pastoralists themselves. Um, are, are there any attempt any initiatives attempted in, for instance, in controlling stocking rates in the very sensitive environments that you've been talking about? So firstly, there is two types of cattle herders. There is the indigenous nomadic pastoralist cattle herders, and there is the new cattle herders that we are calling. So the difference is the indigenous one who doesn't matter how ma many cattle that you have, the way of living is more sustainable because the cattle are not stacking in one place. What create the uh, greenhouse gases from the cattle when they are stacking in one place and then they have all the dunk and then the dunk create all the gas that can go to the atmosphere. But no, it is the opposite from the nomadic indigenous peoples, cattle herders. So we stay like two days in one place, three days in another one, and like maximum seven days in one place. And even when we say one place, it is just the camp of the communities. And then the cattle go grazing around all the places the entire time. And that help the cow dung to be dispread around all the land that we are moving. And it's help to fertile the land. So when you pass with all the cow dunk around places is split it when it's uh, dry heat so then everything dried when the rainy season come so then the rain take all the nutrient substance inside the soil and you come back you will see around all those places the pastures and the plant are more well greener than the other places so that how we are helping to capturing the carbon in the soil so it is a driver of mitigation and also of adaptations of the land. So this is the most one who is creating a carbon neutral zero net, milk and meat, 
because the way of living, it's helping to restore the nature, to mitigate the ecosystem and to create a most sustainable life for all the rest of the species. When you have the plant, you have the insect. When you have the insect, you have the birds who can come and take them. When you have the birds, you have the all the ecosystem balance it's keeping. This is the most important we are keeping and we wanted to keep and have, have the help of everyone to keep it. The second one is the new way of holding the cattle. So those are coming from the rich peoples who can be a from the military general colonel or whatever who can come from the ministers or director or whatever they buy a piece of land they buy a cattle they have hundred or thousand of them they put them for the prestige and then they buy the food for those cattle they can go grass during the rainy season but during the dry season they are stuck in one place and then they have to use the other land land who can create food for the peoples to cultivate a food for those cattle. And while the cattle are stuck in one place, so they are not mobile to help the land to get uh, fertile. They are not used to give the space to the other peoples to do the farm for the food because they are eating the food for the cattle. And then the production is can create the greenhouse gases. So I wanted you to make the two difference of those different elders. And then yet the indigenous pastoralists, we do have our own strategy and our strategy is keeping moving, protecting the land. And it is the government who can open the corridors, the stopping place to limit it, the, the farmers areas and the, the pastoralist area. So the examples that I'm doing on it is on the mapping that I create. So when I do the participatory mapping, we open the corridors of movement. So we map all that. We map the stopping place. And then we ask all the communities to come together and then they, how they can respect those corridor of movement, those stopping place, and how after the harvesting, then the cattle can go over some farm to help them to get fertile. So those strategy that we are using for now and they are really working well to keep peace between communities, to restore the ecosystem, and to help the government to understand the land management by the indigenous pastoralist communities. Thank you. Um, I, I was I, I was struck by the way you talked about um, how conflict has emerged in in some of the on some of these areas and uh, the the Boko Haram uh, impact, but also. To, to what extent is food insecurity uh, uh, is food insecurity driven by some of the changes in rainfall that you talked about uh, driving strife and conflict as as, as well um, your your mapping is is helping address um, so climate change is also uh, apart from the Boko Haram impact. Uh, an issue is that is that true yes right so uh, you know when you look at all the map of the region where there are boko haram they are the most poor regions between chad cameroon niger and nigeria it is all around lake chad it is the place where there is, is very difficult to access to control and it is the place where the uh, communities are most poor one because of the climate change impact so the uh, last mapping that i did around lake chad the one i'm finalizing to digitalize the 3500 kilometers there is new islands that are coming up the island that dead only on three years old because the place used to be wet and after three years, so then the island come out and then this island is populated by the refugee from Nigeria run it from Boko Haram. So just to, to give you the sense how they can use those species, the poverty of the peoples, how climate change is giving them more opportunity to take over the, the, the land and then to terrorize the peoples and peoples have to run from their own home, homeland. So, of course, it is accelerating the Boko Haram issues and also 
at the same time, when you look at Burkina Faso, around all the ISIS, the Islamic uh, group that they are calling, are terrorizing every single day the communities around the rural areas to kill them, to take the man, to keep them in uh, their side. So it is the way to recruit, it is the way to terrorize, but it is the way also to steal from all the communities. It is very sad. So from the mapping that we did, uh, one of the anecdotes that I have, after we finalized the map, so we called the local authorities, the governor, the, uh, and then the chief of police, the chief of uh, military, they all come. Uh, and then we have thousands of people, community presented all the map. And at the end, I, I get pulled aside by the chief of the police. He said, like, you know what? If you when you finalize the map, we wanted to have a copy because that can help us to follow all the people who can steal cattle or steal things because this map is showing us all the land so we can navigate around. I'm like, oh, I hear you. And then I got pulled by the chief of the military. He said, like, you know what? If you finish the map, we wanted to have the copy because it can help us to follow all the Boko Haram peoples who can hide between the islands because then we know from the map, we can know which will be the shortcut to go and then keep them. I'm like, yes, I hear you. But firstly, the map is done to help the communities to better manage and share the natural resources to mitigate the conflict between them, but not for you to have your own strategy. You must support the community first to be stable, to get the revenue, and then they cannot be terrorized by those who can come and steal their land. So yes, the map can help to mitigate the, this conflict. And for your second question about the food insecurity and food security, so when you have the rain who come and float all the species, so then it can float all the crops, the crops can root. When there is not enough rain and then there is uh, pastures or there, there is a crops, then the crop will dry up. Both of the extreme weather events can end up with the food insecurity. And that's what's happening directly for our cattle. Because I remember when I was young with my grandmother, we used to milk morning and evening. And then during the dry season, we milk every single day once. Either we choose morning or we choose evening. But now during the dry season, community milk only once every two days. So the first day we milk for ourselves. The second day you have to leave the cows to give the milk for the veal, for their own babies. Otherwise the babies will die because they cannot get enough milk. And that has the impact in our economy because we sell the milk to buy cereal and the rest of the nutrient that we need. So we cannot get enough economy to buy all what we need. Or we cannot get enough milk also to drink for ourselves. So we have to cope with the new food. So the wild species or the cereal and most of the time, you know, the pasta now and going to the community, I'm shocked because we do not used to see a pasta. We always have millet, that's the only one that we know. And then people eat a lot of things that they do not know because they are cheap and it's create a sickness. Now we have a very higher rate of diabetic peoples that we never had because we are uh, nomadic peoples working around all the places, working very hard. And then we get peoples who get a uh, uh, cancer for the beginning, like the last five years. For us, it is like what is happening at the communities. We do not know what is happening. And it's ended up even my own younger brothers died of cancer that we couldn't detect it earlier. The time that we detect it, it was already led. So that's what's happening exactly from the food insecurity leading to the health of the communities who are getting more and more impacted. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to bring, uh, uh, you know, if you like, to, the wider picture, but I have one final question, if I can, from Nisha Kenny, um, uh, who's a climate researcher at the IIEA. And she she says how your mapping projects combine traditional indigenous knowledge with modern satellite technology to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change. Can you expand on what can be done to increase funding and the availability 
of technology for such projects. That's true. I mean, this project is very interesting. You can see when uh, I design it, so I get the satellite images from the organization who have a satellite in the sky. So who is really like not in the level of my community or of what I'm doing. So it is like the unique work. And when I get the map from the satellite image, I put it for the communities. They look at like it's nothing. There is no data there. It's only like big lines. So then you need a technology. So you need a software to digitalize the map. You need an application to show also where are the different species in order to have the legend of the bigger species that you want, like different crabs and et cetera. And of course you need the communities and their knowledge. And it doesn't matter that they do not speak the same languages, they have the same language of the environment altogether. So to scale up those this work and then the science and technology, there is need of the partnership with the organization who get a satellite images who can give the images to the communities, uh, the later image of three days or seven days maximum, then communities can do the map. There is needs of the software who can facilitate to the organizations to give them all the information that they need. But there is need also of involvement of the scientific peoples and uh, uh, tech peoples who can do the uh, uh, digitalizations. Now I'm working with the uh, 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 technicians who are from DRC. Those are the ones who are helping me to do the uh, digitalizations because they do have the software. So I do the work with the community. I take all the image and then they help me to digitalize and i do work with an organization in italy that are helping me to capture all what i need from the beginning the data that i need and then i can approach the organization to get but it's very hard to get the access of those technology and those science i talked for example with google because when you go to the open street map or you go to the google earth you open those regions, you do not see all the villages or all the places. And then what I propose it to them, from my map, I have all the data. So if we partnership, they give me the information that I need, at the end, they can have those information and to make all their, uh, uh, their website more rich and then people can access them. They say, yes, it is interesting, but yet to today, no one get back. So when I talked with them, this seems like it is very interesting. And at the end of the day, they just like think they have to do something important. They do not know what is important for us. What is important for us is how we can better manage the natural resources, how we can better share it, how we can mitigate the conflict, how we can know our environment, how we can keep the knowledge for the long term. And having the technology is keeping those knowledge for long term because our knowledge are oral as indigenous peoples so there is need of course and uh, uh, I'm going to do like another map in Niger I still wanted to do that and then I still need the organization that can give me more data more information to support me on what I'm doing technically financially yes but also technically in order to have all the data all the uh, human resources that I need to do it and it is possible to scale it up in every places and how we can pass those knowledge to another communities to do the same adapt to their own realities in order to fight the climate change and to put the indigenous people's knowledge in the center thank you thank you hindu um there's a question from jill donahu who's deputy director general of the iiea uh, uh, who indeed uh, like all of us i think thank you for your most interesting presentation um, she asks about your expectations for the Sustainable Development Goals Summit in uh, next September in, in New York, I, I think. Um, how can the voices of Indigenous people be included in COP28 in a meaningful way and to ensure that partnerships emerge between institutions, governments and Indigenous peoples? Yeah, thank you so much for, for that. So. Uh... The uh, summit in New York for the uh, Sustainable Development Gold will be like, is the first summit that we are organizing for too long for the SDGs. And it is about how we can shift all the SDGs 
fasten the implementation of them because we already coming to the 2030 and then we are so far from the implementation of them. So what I'm expecting is how the two co-chairs, the Premier Minister Mia and then the Premier Minister Trido can come together and put the indigenous peoples in the center. Indigenous peoples have six references on the SDGs. So how from those six references, we can have our place into the summit to contribute around all the 17 goals. So I can say the most to 16, and then the partnership who is the 17 one. We wanted to partner with all those who are implementing at the local level, not only at the national level. National level, they must do the right policies, but we are the ones who are implemented at the local level. For example, like in my community, we are working to set up a educations for indigenous girls and then for the indigenous communities who do not have access to the educations. It is one of the SDGs. As indigenous peoples collectively, we have a committee that are working into the just the transitional energy, how the new minerals that are uh, that the communities uh, in developed world are going to use to do like all the batteries for their uh, new electric ve vehicle or new way of electricity, all those minerals are into the indigenous people's land. How they can uh, we can be there to be the guardian, to just like take what they need, not more, to respect the indigenous peoples and to do the just transitional energy fear. So we have so many preparation as indigenous peoples. So my expectation is seeing Mia and Trido to involve indigenous peoples in that summit. The summit during UNGA is always very complicated because many heads of state are coming there, but it is not an excuse, it is not a reason. Indigenous peoples must be there. They must be in the center of this summit. Secondly, for the COP28, you said, so as indigenous peoples, we start to do some work with the COP28 presidency. Firstly, for us, there is no excuse to they have to face out fossil fuel. As we are going to the country who built himself based on the oil, it is time that they stop all what they are digging. And then they can take this money to invest into the adaptation, resilience, and loss and damage. And secondly, we are working with them to see how we can create a mechanism for the direct access finance for indigenous peoples. The finance that can fund the loss and damage in our communities, the finance that can fund the adaptation and resilience measure in our communities, and how the finance can go to our regions. And now uh, we are going to have a pavilions at the COP28 as indigenous peoples, and we are requesting to have a high level dialogue with the COP presidency and the member state. And we are requesting also to be in the presidential of the two days, to do not be sitting aside. Then they talked about us and about our home, like forest or gracious, but we be in the tables to talk with them. So we are looking forward to all that. But facing out fossil fuel is really the most important and putting all the money for loss and damage that can give direct access finance is the second for the indigenous peoples. Thank you. You've you've covered a lot there with uh, two uh, two big uh, meetings. Um, a, a little question, which uh, is probably our our, fi our final question today, um, and that is, um, what lessons can we learn from the role that indigenous women play in climate adaptation? Indigenous women, you said. Yes. Sure. So indigenous women are playing a big role in climate change. If we do not put the women in the center, we will not win the battles. It is as you have your football club team playing and you don't have a goalkeepers. Because the women are the goalkeepers. If you do have the women's, you can win the match. If you don't have the women, you cannot win the match. It is the same. Indigenous women are the goalkeepers of all the climate solutions in our communities. The, the women do have a lot of details, knowledge, the knowledge around food, the knowledge around water, 
around medicinal plant, the knowledge about how they can keep all their environment healthy, the, the knowledge that they are transla translating and transferring to the next generation, to the girls and to the boys. So indigenous women play a big role of goalkeepers for the climate change solutions. And they are also the teachers. They are also a masters. They are also a healers. So for us, we, we do not have like a checking box of make sure that indigenous women to be in the tables. So indigenous peoples in all our uh, uh, seven social cultural regions are present. So that's the particularity of indigenous peoples. In our constituency, we have always the women in the centers and youth in the center. We do not argue about putting a criteria in the meeting, like let us have a woman or let us have a youth, because it is automatic for us. Women and youth are part of our society. They are contributing a lot and they always giving a role that they are playing. It could be maybe in the shadow that we are pushing to put it in the light but women play always a very important role. Thank you very much indeed. I think that's really powerful. I, I, for me, I, I thought um, the, the message that you offered us that the indigenous people have a, a wholly disproportionate role to play in, um, in climate change uh, adaptation, mitigation, in the conservation of biodiversity. Um, that came across very strongly, but I think underlying all your remarks was this crucial point that you don't want to be considered simply as beneficiaries of humanitarian programs. You want to be considered uh, and you want to be active as partners in the activities and whole series of activities to, to try and bring us back onto the path that we need to be for the sustainability of our, of our civilizations. So um, on behalf of Irish Aid, I'm sure, on behalf of the Institute for International European Affairs, and on behalf of all the people who've joined this webinar today, I want to thank you sincerely, Hindu Ibrahim. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.